<laughs> no? Yeah? Gone. Still a little echoey. Test. That's good. Praise the Lord. All right, let's pray. Lord, you said that you're holy and you expect us to be holy. So, Father God, through your Lord and Savior, through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, he's brought us into a place where it's a choice and we can be holy. And it's by the power of your word that gives us an understanding of that, Lord, the power of your word. So, Father God, I ask that the word that's spoken here today, your word, not my mouth, but your word that's spoken here today would touch the minds and hearts of each and every one of us, Lord, so that true repentance can come, true growth can come, true conviction can come, because all these prunings are necessary for us to grow. So give us a better understanding of that, Lord, each and every one of us, myself included, Father God, in Jesus' name, amen. Man, I don't know about you, but I'm tired of playing church. I'm tired of community centers. I'm tired of that stupid stuff. Because I say stupid, every time I say stupid, that means there's no Holy Spirit. All right, so don't get me wrong. It's just there's no Holy Spirit. That's my definition of stupid. No Holy Spirit. And that's why we're in the place we're in. You know, I'm just one man. You know, you're just one person. But if we come together, there's strength in that. But it's only within us if it were true warriors of Christ, right? Not all of us are warriors. Not all of us have been called to be warriors, right? Warriors have to lay down everything. And it starts off by laying down everything who we are, right? Our identity and what we perceived who we were. Because we're not that anymore, right? We're not that anymore. If we truly believe that, that's the start that ignites everything else that God wants to do with us. Then comes the, the uh, Takis, the Fiego. Fiego, wow, I'm not too good with that name. Fire, here comes the, the fire comes. Thank you, Fiego. Fiego, that's in, that's in Takis, praise the Lord. I don't need Takis anymore. Praise God, it stained my teeth. Then it's told me I gotta stop eating them. I said, you drink a lot of coffee? I said, no, I don't drink a lot of coffee. I drink one cup a day. He goes, well, your teeth are getting more stained than us. Let me think. Takis. I, I got to wear surgical gloves when I dipped in to eat them because they were staining my fingers. So what can imagine what they were doing to my teeth? So praise the Lord. I don't know why I'm going there with all that. But it leaves a stain in our life. Praise God. Anyway. It's interesting how God is putting everything together and how he does every time because he never fails us, right? Praise the Lord. And, you know, I got into this whole thing about I'm learning this stuff. I did a teaching early on about to be awoke instead of woke, you know, because these are things I'm learning about all these crazy people out there that are in the world. And the other one I've seen is cancel culture, right? It's cancel culture. And you hear that more and more and more by people. It's like, what the heck is cancel culture? You know, and I started looking it up and what it's basically defined is they want to they want to dissolve history. They want to dissolve history. You know, they want to dissolve George Washington. They want to dissolve everything that's that's created this country. But you see, the enemy's behind it all because everything, if you back it all up, that started this country was God. Because it was in God we trusted. Right. And it was in God that they trusted our forefathers. And that is what's happening here. The enemy is using cancel culture to get into that place of understanding, to dissolve history. And that's where I have to step in and I'm saying, listen, this book isn't a history book. And that's the problem with a lot of people. We look at it as history when it's a history making book. And if we continue to, to look at it as a history book, cancel culture is going to cancel the history of this book. And we're doomed. We're doomed. And that's what's going to happen. It's on my heart because people are just so secular. It's ridiculous. It's so secular. And it isn't really that difficult not to be secular. Jesus said we're to be in the world, but not of it. It shouldn't be that difficult for us. Why is it? 
You know, I go back to the basics of 101 when we started this process. The first couple of scriptures God ever gave me, we put them all over the doors and everything else. 2 Corinthians 5.17, right? 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Behold, all things have passed away. No, all things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So we look at that, we speak it, but the question I have to ask you is, do we really believe it? Do we really believe it? This is something that we've probably heard a thousand times, maybe more, depending on how long you've been around here. We hear it over and over and over, but we have to look at it again and meditate on it. Therefore, if anyone is what? In Christ. If anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. All things have passed away. All things have passed away. Behold, old some things become new. <laughs> no, all, all things become new. We can't deviate from that. All things become new. If anything's going to create a problem from us being that new creation, we're supposed to be in Christ, then we have to get rid of it. We have to find a way to dissolve it. It's difficult to understand that we're making history with this book. Listen, it's exciting for me to know that every day that I'm not reading this as a history book. I don't have, you know, 100 questions that I have to answer about, you know, Moses and Elijah and Elisha and all the prophets and so on and so forth because it's given it to be given to me by the Holy Spirit because I'm going to make history with this book. And when I say make history, I'm making history of my life on this planet while I have the years here for his glory. And that's what each and every one of us have to have a mindset in. But how can we do that if we're not the new creation from in Christ? It's difficult. It's difficult. Listen, I'm not saying you're not saved, but it's difficult. Because we're fighting it. I'm not asking questions. No hands. All things have become new. That's the first scripture. The second scripture, the part of the second scripture we have on our t-shirts, right? It's in John 8, 31 and 32. And Jesus said to those Jews that believed them, if you're my disciples, and if you know the truth, if you know the truth, who shall set you? My gosh. And Jesus said to those Jews who believed them, if you abide in my word, you're my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Okay? We read that all the time. The guys in the print shop must print it over and over hundreds and thousands of times. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> But the thing is, there's three, there's four words here that we have to magnify here. The first one, Jesus says, to those that believe, right? He's talking to the Jews, but he's talking to me and you too. We have to believe. And then when he says, when we start to believe, then what? We need to abide. We need to remain. We need to remain in him. Those who are in Christ are a new creation. We have to remain in him. This is basic 101. Why, why am I going here? Because you haven't got it yet. Because you need to repent still. Ooh, here comes conviction. Yeah, we need to repent still. God's not moving like he wants to move in this barn because we still need to repent and be honest with ourselves, transparent with ourselves, so that he can see right through us with nothing in between. But we like to hide things. We like to hide things about us. And like God was saying through Stephanie, you know, some of you guys, some of you people in here, your mind wasn't even in what she was probably saying, what the Lord was using her to say. And that's why God gets angry. Because we can't even focus on him because it's whether it's the devil, the demons, or your own flesh that's letting that go there. Because why isn't he moving like he should? 
God wants to move really bad. He's just looking at those people that are fully committed to him to do that. I mean, he's moved in my life. I, I'm not complaining whatsoever. But I'm standing here because I want that to happen to you. That's the only reason why. I love what he's doing in my life. And I love what he's doing in your lives. And I, he wants more. He wants more for you. For you. For all those that truly believe. For those that believe that abide in him. And when we truly believe and we abide in him, then what? Then we know him. Then we know Jesus. Praise God there's a relationship. We have a relationship, not religion. You shall know. Know what? The truth. Man, the truth brings conviction. The truth brings conviction. It's supposed to bring conviction because we are wretched people. I'm a wretched man. I need conviction so I can grow. I mean, Jesus even said to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. So you think you're better than Paul? His grace is sufficient for us. That's the love of God. That's the love of Jesus. When we understand that. But we have to believe, he says. We have to know. We have to believe, we have to abide, and we have to know. And we have to know the truth. Then we're made free. Then the process starts that we're made free. And that's where everyone gets confused. Because that's where everybody thinks, oh, I got deliverance, so I'm good forever. Yeah, it's an awesome feeling to have. It's an awesome revelation that when we are set free, right? When we can walk out into the atmosphere, into the outside, into the air to know that God has done something. But now that God has done something, he wants you to do something. And that becomes the problem with a lot of us. We're not doing what we're supposed to be doing. And it all starts with repentance. Listen, when we truly repent, I truly repent to him every morning. Every morning I truly repent and have my communion with him at 4.30 in the morning. I'm starting my day and then getting into relationship with Jesus so I can get through a day. Because I have to die daily. And if I have to do that, why don't you? Deliverance is the beginning, not the end. The deliverance that we have when we walk through that and healing, it's the beginning, not the end. It's new. It's new. And everything that is new, we have to understand what it's all about. That new creation, we have to understand. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. You shall know the truth. The truth shall make you free. We have to absorb the word of God so that we can bring it into a better understanding so we can live more for him and less for us. Anybody agree? Yeah. <laughs> Praise God. So I want to go into Exodus, but I'm going to get out of it too, trust me. I'm not getting stuck in Exodus. All right, Doug? How do you say it again? Yeah, we're not going to get stuck there. We're going to break loose. Praise the Lord. So let's go in Exodus 17. We're going to go to verses 1 through 6. Got a purpose for all this. Then all the congregation at total freedom set out on their journey from the wilderness of sin. According to the commandment, no, that's not total freedom, the congregation of the children of Israel. On their journey from the wilderness of sin, according to the commandment of the Lord, encamped in Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people contended with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. So Moses said to them, Why do you contend with me? Why do you tempt the Lord? 
And the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, Why is it you have brought us out of Egypt to kill us and our children, our livestock, blah, blah, blah. So Moses cried out to God, to the Lord, and sa saying, What shall I do with this people? They're almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Go on before the people, take with you some of the elders of Israel, also take in your hand your rod, with which you struck the river and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock of Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and the water will come out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. Praise the Lord. So a miracle of God takes place. A miracle of God. God is using Moses as a vessel for the power of God to move. Okay, so now we move on. We're going to go on to verse eight, jump from eight to verse eight. So now Amalek, he came, fought with Israel and Rephidim. And Moses said to Joshua, choose us some men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses said to him and fought with Amalek and Moses, Moses Aaron and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And so it was when Moses held his hand, hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let it down, his hand, Amalek, prevailed. But Moses' hand became heavy, so they took a stone and put it under him. And he sat on it, and Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side and other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. So Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this for a memorial in the book. Recount it in the hearing of Joshua that I will utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called its name, the Lord is my banner, which is Jehovah Nissi. For he said, because the Lord has sworn, the Lord will, ha will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Hallelujah. So the Lord moves Moses through a miracle to bring water in, then he brings it, then it comes a battle. And it's interesting because if you look at the, 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 the word Rephidim means rest. So here we are in a place of rest. And now we've got these Amaleks coming to bother our rest, right? They're coming to create a problem. Just like in this, right now, the analogy of us, we can have a place of rest with Jesus, but things are going to cause a problem in our life. They're going to come, a it's going gonna, it's gonna to cause a problem. And when he says in verse 16, because the Lord has sworn the Lord, because the Lord has sworn the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation, this is an illustration really of our sinful nature and who we are. There's always going to be a war in that sinful nature of who we are. Paul says it in Galatians 5, right? When he talks about it in 16 or 17, how the sinful nature and the spirit are always going to be at odds with each other, paraphrasing it. There's a war going on. There's a battle going on. But what God is showing Moses is that when we praise him, when those hands go up and we praise him, the victory is ours. The victory is ours. When we put our hands down and we start doing things the way we want to do them, we start losing. But then on top of that, what does he do? He brings in Aaron and Ur to show us, listen, you can't do it by yourself. We can't do it by ourselves. There was 120 in that upper room, but they were all in one accord. All in one accord. There wasn't one guy thinking of a Bills game. There wasn't another guy thinking of what I'm going to have to eat later. There wasn't. They were all in one accord for something to happen. For something to happen. And there's power in that. There's power in it. And God showed that because when Aaron and Ur took care of Moses, held him up, they took him on, they destroyed him. They defeated the sinful nature. The fellowship is important. Iron, sh iron sharpening iron is vital. We can't think we're a lone ranger or we can sit in the corner and do it by ourselves. Or sometimes we just sit there because we want to hide what we're trying to hide from everybody else. Like the song Cages. I can't fake it. 
We can only fake it for so long. We can't be a mannequin. We can't be these things. We have to be who God wants us to be. And it's going to hurt sometimes. It's going to hurt, but without hurt, without hurt, there's no gain. No pain, no gain. In sports, it's that way. Why would it be any different spiritually? If it's that way in our body, and it's that way in our mind, because we have to mindset our, put our mindset in the mind of Christ, why is it going to be any different spiritually? It's not. I learned early on in my walk every time, and I heard a lot. Whenever I heard a lot, I said, praise God, something new's going, something good's going to happen. I don't focus on my pain. I focus, I focus on what's going to happen. Moses praising God, the victory is his, his like us. When we praise him, when we're praising him, there's victory. Many times, just saying the word hallelujah, praise God. It just brings a whole peace that comes right through the whole body. Praise God. There's a rest, but we have to beware because Rephidim's around the corner. MLX around the corner. Our sinful nature's around the corner. And guess what? We can't cast out self. Hallelujah. That's a revolution. A revolution. That's a rev revolution and a revelation. We can't cast out self. We have to face self every day in the mirror. We have to look at ourselves to see who we are, who we really are in Christ. Or who we really are and who we think we want to be. And that's a lie. It's a deception. We're nothing without Jesus. Everything formed from within us comes from the power of Jesus Christ. The blood on the cross. That's what the victory was for. That's what the victory was for. Hallelujah. So when I say we can't cast out self, let's continue with Moses. I want to go to Numbers chapter 20. I'm going to start at verse uh, 6. So ironically, here come the complainers again. They don't have water anymore. They need more water. I mean, don't, you know, we complain, right? We all complain. We complain about what we don't have. We don't, we, don't, we don't look at what we do have and thank God for the blessing. Right? It's always complaining, and that's what's going on here again. And here goes Moses. We start at verse 6. So Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the door of the tabernacle of meeting, and they fell on their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take the rod, you and your brother Aaron, gather the congregation together. Speak to the rock before their eyes, and it will yield its water. Thus you shall bring water for them out of the rock, and give drink to the congregation and their animals. So Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock, and he said to them, Hear now, you rebels! Exclamation point. Must we bring, must we bring water for you out of this rock? Then Moses lifted his hand and struck the rock twice with his rod, and water came out abundantly, and the congregation and their animals drank. Praise God. End of story, huh? No. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, because you did not believe me to hollow me in the eyes of the children of Israel. Therefore, you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. This was the water of Meribah, because the children of Israel contended with the Lord, and he was hollowed among them. And that's the key here, okay? So God tells Moses to do something. And out of his anger, he does something that he wants to do. And it's interesting because some people will say, and I say this too, that Moses wasn't open to something new. He wasn't open to something new. He wanted to do what he wanted to do and what he saw he did before. And interesting as well, he did not bring elders with him. First time elders were there. They were called out. God told them to bring elders. 
God shouldn't have to tell us every time what to do. He tells us in the word it's done and now we should become, it should become an action of how we do things. He didn't call the elders. He let his his Amalek sinful nature take over and then he did what God didn't want him to do. And you know, this was one of the few times that he ever did something that it was the only one of the only sins that he actually did and look what God did. He kept him from going into the promised land. He didn't want to move. He didn't want to change. He didn't want to do things that were different. And out of anger, he did what he did before. But the interesting part here, too, is that, listen, he didn't believe. He didn't believe, and God didn't use him as a vessel, but God still came through with the power. Because, see, he didn't hollow God, but at the end it says that they hollowed him because of the miracle. But see, that's where we lose it. That's where we lose it, me and you. We're a vessel for God to give him glory. But when we take things into our own hands, the glory of God's going to follow through, but it's not going to come from us. He's not going to use us the, as a vessel that we think we're, he's going to use us. And then comes more torment. Then comes more torment. Because now we've got this sin in our life, we're trying to hide it. We're trying to hide it and face things like it doesn't exist, but it's there. Because there isn't true repentance and it really hasn't opened up. And that's what happens when we're carrying the wrong fire. That's what happens when we're carrying the wrong fire. Let's go to Leviticus chapter 10. That doesn't mean we're not going to heaven. That doesn't mean you're not saved, but that means, what it does mean is there's a struggle in this life. And God does not want us to struggle. He wants to, us to be in Rephidim. He wants us to be in that place of rest. And when that sinful nature tries to come, when Amalek tries to come, praise him. You praise him. You need help? Bring Chris, Josh, myself, Victoria, any of Lisa, Lisa, Mark, anyone. Bring them up. Hold those hands up. Praise the Lord. We're doing this together. Praise God. But do we do that? Or are we trying to hide it? Praise the Lord. So let's go to Leviticus chapter 10. We're going to want verses 1 through 3. And this is Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron. He took his censer and put fire in it, put incense on it, and offered profane fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. So there's a disobedience. So fire went out from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. And Moses said to Aaron, this is what the Lord spoke, saying, by those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy, and before all the people, I must be glorified. And Aaron got angry, he got mad at God, because his boys died, and he ran from God. That's not what happened, huh? Is that what's up there? No. No. So Aaron held his peace. Held his peace. See, when the Lord gives us rest, when he's in us, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. When that's happening, he's going to give us peace no matter what happens, even if it's family. I bring up Nile and what happened in his life, what took place with the idiots in Canada and how they're, they got the whole COVID thing going on. It's, it's, it's hindering people to see their, their loved ones before they pass away. And then he gets last minute notice and he can't even get a fill in for the radio. So he's got to go live at 7 a.m. And I'm listening to it. It's like, praise God, I'm praying for him. And, and just you wouldn't even have known it. So someone got on the phone and they knew because they had talked to him, I guess. And he offered condolences for his mom who passed away at 214 in the morning a.m. But listening and hearing him, texting and talking to him before and after his radio program 
There's a man of God. He has peace. He has peace with what's in front of him. We have the rest that Jesus gives us if he's truly with us. Hallelujah. See, now these guys, from the outside, they look really good. They had all the proper stuff. They had the incense. Everything was burning just the way it should be. Everything was good. Everything's good when you're in a big church and everybody's just part of the walls. But when you start to press in, and they started to press in, God realized there's profane fire here. And they got burned up. They got burned up. Man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. Man looked at Saul, but God looked at David. We need to take our eyes off man. We need to take our eyes off the world and see it from a different perspective. Like I said last week in the teaching, we need to see things spiritually, not what's actually right in front of our face. Because things that happen spiritually already, already brought that into existence. And by the power of God, we can change that through him. As long as we're the key vessel that he's using, like he used Moses up until the point where he decided he didn't want to be a vessel anymore, he let the sinful nature take over. Praise the Lord. And as they pressed in, it was exposed. It was profane. It was wrong. It was unacceptable. It was unorth unauthorized. Un unauthorized. Unauthorized. It came out. That's what profane means. All those cinnamons that you get when you put it on your pancakes and stuff. No, it's the wrong cinnamon. Praise the Lord. Profane means it's wrong. It's unacceptable. And it's unauthorized. But yet they look good on the outside. Proverbs chapter 5, verse 21. If you can bring the MLT up on that, honey. For the Lord sees clearly what a man does, examining every path he takes. So see... I've said this many times, and sometimes I guess sometimes we can forget and not realize that God sees everything, knows everything. He's omnipresent. I mean, there's nothing we can hide from him. I mean, he's there. And then when he's really there and he's really in you, then it's a lot more difficult to walk in sin. It's a lot more difficult. That doesn't mean we're not. David got caught up in it. It was brought to his attention. He repented. A true repentance. It happens. But the bottom line is the key is, are we truly repenting? Do we really even see it as a necessary of repentance? Everything's a necessary of repentance. It's a cleansing. God says he's holy. We're to be holy. We can't press in because if we press in like Ahab, not Ahab, Aaron's two sons, when we press in, that's an easy way out. When we press in and we're not really holy, we're not really living like we say we're living, it's going to get exposed. And it's going to show because it's going to burn up in how we are. It's going to show. And listen, there's no excuse. There really isn't. We just have to repent and move forward and not carry things that aren't ours. We truly repent, it's gone. But if you truly haven't repented, you're always going to carry it. It's always going to be there. Poor me, this and that. No, you repent, it's gone. Why? Because you're a new creation. Therefore, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. If you're in Christ, it's new. God says so. He's not going to remind you of these things. You move forward, new. But we have to believe that. We have to believe. I believe, believe, abide, and know. To believe is to abide, it's to remain, right? It's to get in his word and remain in it. One more proverb, an NLT as well, honey. Proverb 20, verse 27. The Lord's light penetrates the human spirit, 
exposing every hidden motive. So that's like going into the most holy place. If we want to go into the presence of God, you think he's going to open a door if you're still carrying things? No, he's not. And you can pretend like you're there, but you're not there. And how do I know you're not there? Because it gets exposed. It gets exposed. I'm talking from personal experience. If I'm not living the way God wants me to live, I'm not going to get into that presence that I want to be in. But I know pretty quickly that I'm not. So I'm repenting and asking where I need to grow and understand that I need to press in to get into that place. Because when you're in there, you don't want to leave. So, Lord, the only thing I'm going to leave is you're going to have to boot me out with your boot. You're going to have to kick me right out of there. I want to be there because where else do I want to be? Where else do we really want to be? You've got to ask yourself that. Oh, I want to be in the arms of Victoria. I want to be Victoria. No, I'd rather be with Jesus. She's second. She's second. That's the way it should be. If you're thinking otherwise, you're wrong. You're unauthorized. It's profane fire. Profane. I don't want to get burned up. But it's not that I don't want to get burned up. I want to be in the presence. I want to be saturated with that love. I want to be saturated with Jesus. I want him to grow me. I want to understand him more. So what's our motive? God knows them all. What's our motive? What's our reason to try to hide? Pride? I mean, why, why would you have to hide? I don't hide anything. If I'm a mess, I'm going to tell you I'm a mess. Because I want to get better. The enemy wants to do that. He doesn't want us to be in the place he want, God wants us to be because he knows what damage you can do. He'd rather keep you surreal, just coasting through life, thinking you're saved, and that's good. But there's no dents in anything, nothing going on there. But as soon as you do that, as soon as you press in, that's when the enemy's going to start coming. That's when we have to be ready to fight. It's a battle. But we already won. The victory's ours. That's the mindset we have to have. Praise the Lord. So yeah, again, what's our motive? Do we really believe? Do we really abide? Do we really know? Are we being made free? We got to ask that question, right? To ourselves. Praise the Lord. First Corinthians chapter 4, verse 20. My hello today to Pastor Guy. Is everybody okay? Four twenty. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. Very short verse, but very powerful verse. Hallelujah. Holy Spirit power. This is the difference from talking about this culture stuff, this cancel culture stuff. They're going to try to cancel history. Or they are already doing it. They're canceling history as much as they can get away with, with this whole political thing going on. And the bottom line is if this continues to be categorized as history, it's going to dissolve because that's the word without the power. That's the word without the power. But God has the power. He's ready to give it to us to ignite. He's ready to use us as a vessel to do this. But we have to be in the right place. We can't be like Moses. We can't be in the place of Meribah. The waters of Meribah. It was an important place because we should learn something from that. He's a man of God. A man of God. Like David. But there was places that we have to learn, that we have to understand, that we have to move forward from so that we can't do the same thing they've done. We don't want to do the same thing they've done. We don't want that mindset that we don't want something new. God's got something new for us. We have to walk it out. 
It's got to be the power. And the power is the history making. I'm making history because if I die tomorrow, this place is going to take over by somebody else. And they're going to say, well, where did this come from? And they're going to bring up my name. But that'll be the end of it. But at least I made a mark. At least there's a history making happening. Something's taking place to advance God's kingdom for his glory. And that's what should be in each and every one of our hearts. Advancing his kingdom above everything else. You see, and then when, we, when the word is with power, I want to go through a couple of verses in Psalm 119. Let's go to Psalm 119. A lot of powerful verses in Psalm 119. It's a long psalm, but there's a lot of powerful verses pertaining to his word. We'll start with uh, verse 11 and 12. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. His word. So when the power of the Holy Spirit hits us, his word is in our heart, not our head. My pastor's wife, Janssen, used to always say there's 16, 18 inches between heaven and hell. When you have the word here, it's hell. When you have the word here, it's heaven. 18 inch difference. I guess I'll tell you where it may be a little different, a little longer, shorter, but you get the gist of it. And the psalmist is saying, listen, the, the word, we have to hide the word in our heart. Why do we have to hide the word in our heart? Because that's where everything starts. That's what's defiled and that's what grows. It comes from the spirit. It comes from the heart and who we are. Like we talked about last week, like Katie got that vision that God showed her that, you know, Adam and Eve were the only ones that were not born in a womb. We're not born in a womb either. I'm born again, not in a womb. You're born again, again, not in a womb. So that heart, Amen. A new creation in Christ. Because he was the first. But we really have to believe that. We can't see, I'm listening, I'm talking to you, but it's God talking to you. And I pray you're receiving it. Not like, oh, there's another sermon. Oh, this isn't a sermon. This is the word of God trying to tell you something. Number one is to repent, because you need to. Each and every one of us need to repent about something. And if you don't think you do, then you got to repent about a lot. Praise the Lord. So the word's got to be hidden. The word's got to be hidden in our heart. And we have to understand what that even means. We got to understand what that means. So when it's hidden in our heart, heart Lord, that I might not sin against you, that we got a chance of victory, that we, you know, we don't have to sin anymore. Somebody spoke that. We don't have to sin anymore. That's an awesome revelation in itself. I've got Jesus to give me strength. I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. So I don't have to sin anymore. That doesn't mean it isn't going to happen, but it, I don't have to. You don't have to. Nobody has to. Nobody's telling you to. The devil didn't make you do it. You did it. Because we're dealing with self, and we can't cast that out. Sometimes I, I pray we could. We can't. So that word is hidden in our heart so that we might not sin. Teach me your statutes. We got to be teachable. We got to remain teachable. We all have to remain teachable. God's going to continue to teach even you and me and everybody else under the sun that's alive and breathing until the day we're with him. And if someone gets to that point where they don't think they remain teachable, then they really need to be taught. And that's where it all starts. Then in verse 27. Make me understand the way of your precepts. So shall I meditate on your wonderful works. Wonderful works. Understand. We have to understand the word of God. We have to understand what I just said about Moses. We have to understand if we go through this history book that you look at and think of, it's not history. It's history making. So when I say it's history making, when we read about Moses, when I saw about Moses and I'm giving it to you about Moses, this is something that should be strengthening me and you. So that hopefully we don't do what Moses did. So that's why the psalmist is saying, make me, make me understand the way. 
the way of your precepts, of your word. And I need to meditate on the wonderful works. Meditate, getting into the word, abiding. If we believe we're going to abide in them, we're going to know. We're going to know by the understanding of his word. It's going to show us things. And every day it'll show us something. If we're in it, if you're in it for five minutes, you do one daily bread devotional, you're, only get, you're, you're going to get what you put into it. So don't expect any more. Like I talked about expectation last year. You're going to, last week, last year, we're still this year. Last week, what you expect is what you're going to get. We reap what we sow. Each and every one of us. So we get an understanding that that word is hitting in our heart. And I don't have to sing. God's going to understand that, and I can learn that by meditating on all the different people in the Bible and what the word of God is telling me spiritually. Let's go to 33. 33 to 35. Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I shall keep it to the end. Give me understanding, and I shall keep your law. Indeed, I shall observe it with my whole heart. Make me walk in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. So again, if we're abiding in him, if we're... See, these are scriptures I quote every morning because they mean the same thing to me. I got to understand who God is. I got to get into the word so that I understand his word. And I got to know it's hidden in my heart so I don't have to sin. But now I'm getting to a place where, you know, I got to walk it out. We have to walk it out. That's what he's telling us to walk it out. But not only should we walk it out, though, it should be a delight to be in the truth. It shouldn't be a work. It shouldn't be mundane. It should be a delight that we're in truth. It shouldn't be a mundane because I can't run out there and use. It shouldn't be mundane because I can't have sex with someone and I'm not married. All the, I can go over and over and everything under the sun. But the bottom line is we need to delight in the truth. And when we delight in the truth, those things aren't going to matter because they they're not even there. They're dissolved. because Why? Because I have the mind of Christ because he's in me. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Behold, all things have passed away. All things become new. So yeah, Amalek might want to come back. The sinful nation might want to come on me. But God's given us his word. He's telling us to hide it in our heart. He's telling us that you don't have to sin anymore. That we can understand this. That we can meditate on it. That we can learn from others in the, in the history making book. So that we can make history ourselves. And not be the way we used to be. Praise God. Delighting in the truth. And in verse 37 and 38. Turn, my, turn away my eyes from looking at worthless things and remind, revive me in your way. Establish your word to your servant who is devoted to fearing you. So when we get into that place of understanding, it's a lot easier to turn our, our eyes away from th something that's not good. Half the time we can be, I can be in here and you can be telling me about different stuff, sports, whatever. I'm half in and I'm walking away because it just doesn't seem to do anything to me anymore. UFC, NFL, whatever it is, it, it just doesn't do the same anymore. It can be a very brief discussion, but it dissolves. Why does it dissolve? Because it's worthless. Why is it worthless? Because that's what God showed me. I don't know if he's showing you that, but he showed me that. Why? Because his word is hidden in my heart. And I don't have to sin. And I can understand what he wants from me. And I can meditate on what's good and what's not good. And we learn to live that way. We learn to live that way. And it's a delight to live that way. If you really understand. But I see people, they're living in torment because they don't understand. It's so where's the delight? Where's the joy? Where is it? And I'm not talking about Avab and Nabu or whatever their names are. I'm not talking about them two had a beautiful outward surface. Because, yeah, we can have a beautiful outward surface. But then when we, we need to, you can't be here without pressing in. And when you start pressing in, we're gonna, God's going to know if it's profane or not. But it's only to expose us so that we can be better in who we are. I'm just what I'm trying to say. We need to be better than who we are. We talk about a move of God, and like Stephanie, the Holy Spirit was moving in her because he brought that to me when we were in worship. Repent, repent, repent. And the words that he got 
from the message that people got. God, listen, we may think it's flesh, but that's God's talking because God is here. God is on this property. God owns this property. Man doesn't own it. Man makes no decisions for this property. God does. So when he says that, we have to listen to what he has to say. Through that, verse 50. So we're turning our eyes from worthless things. He, we, he, we get revived in that delight in his way. We're moving that way now. Why? Because you know what? He's established the word in me. He's established the word in you if you truly believe. And you're devoted to fear him. And what's fearing him? You're not afraid of him. You respect him for the awesomeness on who he is. I would hope that we would think that. Little old punk us. What, what are we? What are we? We're not even a granule of salt in God's eyes. But he loves us. Do we get that revelation knowledge? Are we so puffed up that we think we're so big, like King Saul? Hmm? Do we even have a mindset to understand the fear of God, of who God really is? You watch Lou Giglio. He shows you how the fear of God, how big God is. Do we really even grasp the concept of that understanding and how he sets himself down here as Jesus, as a man, humble to face us, to show us, but let it be known who he is. He holds the Pilates in his hand. The Bible says he bends down to look into the universe. I mean, I, I can't, I can't even, I can't imagine it. All I know is that he loves me. And all I know is I want to give him my heart. And Jesus said, when we do these things, he will manifest himself to us. He said, I will show myself to you. And he has shown himself to me. He shows himself to me every day because of the word, because how I do what I do, what we do, what we should be doing. Instead of being concerned about who all the self things that are going on, the selfishness, the Amalek, the sinful nature. In 50, it says, this is my comfort and my affliction for your word has given me life. I guess I got ahead of myself. But the afflictions, we're going to go through these things. That doesn't mean there isn't going to be pain involved. Affliction really talks about, there's pain in, in affliction. But in that affliction, there's comfort. Why is there comfort? Because you're remaining in him. How do you think Stephen got stoned to death and was smiling? He remained in him. His focus was on Jesus. They thought he was nuts. The demons were flying everywhere. They're killing this man and he's smiling. And he also says, basically, forgive them, Lord. Don't hold that sin on them. And Paul repented. And look what God used, how God used Paul. We don't know who else was there, what happened in their lives, but we know what happened to Paul. So, yeah, when we move in this way of understanding, through the afflictions, we're going to have comfort. We're going to be able to deal with it. Why? Because we, don't, we want it gone. We don't want to be the way we used to be. We want to be that new creation in Christ. So that we can believe and abide and know who Jesus is. And he makes us free. That's the total freedom. But the word make means made, means a process. Doesn't mean because you had deliverance, you're done. It's a process to get there. Deliverance is the beginning of the new. Now, what are you going to do with it? That's the key. That's the key. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. Could you do the uh, NLT, honey? I only got 17 more verses in about two and a half hours. We're good. Yeah. NLT. Yep. Yeah. Don't you realize that in any race, everyone runs, that in a race, everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize. So run to win, exclamation point. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away. But we do it for an eternal prize. So I run with purpose in every step. I am not just shadow boxing. 
I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. See, that's what happens when we have an outer surface, like Nadab and Abihu. That was an outer surface, and when they pressed in, the profane came out. The wrong fire came out, and it got exposed. And that's what Paul's concern is. He said, listen, enough shadow boxing. I was into mixed martial arts. We can shadow box all day, but when you start sparring with someone, you're going to get punched. You're going to get hit, and you've got to know how to take the hit. So shadow boxing only gets you so far. That's the outer surface, the outer surface of what we're doing. But when we press in, we've got to be ready. And it says to train. Paul's saying train ourselves. Train ourselves. Train self. Train self to do what it should do, the discipline. Train self to do what it should do. That's what this whole process is about. You know I don't like saying the word program because it's not. It's a lifestyle change. And with some people, it takes years to change their life. So if you're really committed, it shouldn't matter on a time frame because you're training. You're training to get self into a place where you can actually fight, not just that shadow box. Otherwise, things get disqualified because it all comes out. It all comes out. Psalm 81, verse 7. You called in trouble and I delivered you. I answered you in the secret place of thunder. I tested you at the waters of Meribah. See, God's going to test us in that place. He's going to test us in that place of contention. He's going to test us in the place that Moses was at. And each and every one of us are in that same place. But the question we got to say is, what are we going to do when we get into that place? Are we going to shadow box or are we going to get in fighting? Do we really believe? Are we going to abide? Are we going to know so that we can make a freedom understanding on what we're going to go through so that we're free from it? That we're broken off of it? That it isn't there anymore. I'm a new creation in Christ. A new creation. All the, thing, old, all the old things are gone. Everything's new. Everything's new. Moses didn't want to go there. He wanted to stay in the old. So God says, I'm not going to use it as a vessel. I'm not going to use it as a vessel. They're going to see the glory of God, but it's not going to come through you. We can fake it, but we're never going to make it. You can be saved, but you're not going to do everything God has for you. If you don't press in, press in. Press in so that we can press on. Advance in his kingdom, amen? Yeah. Praise the Lord. All right, let's pray. I was going to ask God to give us, give me a more loving, motivational message, but he said no. Not to give you those motivational things. Lord, thank you for your word, Father God. Thank you, Lord, for, for teaching me and everybody here, Father, that we could grow in an understanding, Lord, from your word and who we, you want us to be, who you want us to be. Not who we want to be, but who you want us to be. Give us a better understanding as we walk out this week, Father God. That everything that, that we do, everything uh, that we say, would bring glory to you, Father. That it would show Jesus. That we would show the light. Show the light and show the love. Show the love. The love that you have for us so we can give it to others. Lord, ask for a hedge of protection around us. Hedge of angels. Your blood's covering us. Guide us. Strengthen us. Protect us, Father. I speak travel mercies on those that have come from outside. Safe travels home later. And Lord, I ask that you bless the food that's been prepared for our body's nourishment. I ask these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord.